Christian Living 101 presents a Bible class on the fundamental basics of victorious Christian living. Establish a strong foundation for conquering the trials and temptations of daily life. Increase your faith and learn to use the powerful weapons of spiritual warfare as you study with Pastor Gene Applegate. Now we join Christian Living 101 in progress. Well, we praise the Lord this beautiful day that He's given unto us, and uh, we just want to say thank you to all of you who have logged on to Christian Living 101 Bible Studies. We're going to be studying about the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ today. Just before we get into the study, we're going to uh, have a song, and I trust it'll be uplifting to your spirit. And uh, so just sit back, relax, and uh, prepare your hearts we're going to start studying in the book of Isaiah chapter 53, uh, if you want to find that in your Bibles today. We'll begin reading with uh, the sixth verse, so you can look for that while we listen to the song. Praise His name. Redemption, I can feel it, condemnation, I don't fear it Cause I'm washed in the blood of the Lamb In that early morning hour when I kneel and feel that power Then I'm washed in the blood of the Lamb Washed in the blood, washed in the blood Washed in the blood of the Lamb In that early morning hour when I kneel and feel that power Then I'm Washed in the blood of the Lamb Sweet redemption, I can feel it Condemnation, I don't fear it Cause I'm washed in the blood of the Lamb There's no question of creation Now that I can feel salvation I'm washed in that blood of the Lamb Washed in the blood Washed in the blood Washed in the blood of the Lamb in that early morning hour when I kneel and feel that power then I'm washed washed in the blood of the Lamb Let's just have a word of prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for the anointing of your Holy Spirit. And Lord, we thank you abundantly for the word of God that you've given us that we might have insight and understanding to your love and compassion for your people and the extent of your mercy and grace that has been extended unto us who were born in the captivation of sin. And so, Lord, we walk in the beautiful victory that you accomplished for us at the cross and we give you praise and thanksgiving for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, even today in this generation where we have so much information at our hand and uh, you can find out just about anything you want to know, it seems, and a lot of things you don't want to know on the Internet. Uh, but uh, I just want to take you back to the Old Testament ages and, and uh, let you see that the Old Testament prophets had been given revelation of God uh, to, for the great Messiah that was going to come and to set them free from the law of the bondage of sin and death. And so uh, we're going to begin reading now in Isaiah 53, 6. It says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now this is Isaiah speaking to us hundreds of years before the birth of Jesus. And yet, he sees the whole picture. He sees uh, uh, the condition that the house of Israel is in. And as I told you, I think last week or the week before, we need to remember that uh, the Bible was written to God's people. And it was a roadmap, if you please. It was a directive uh, revealing the righteous walk in which we are to live as God's chosen ones. And so it's important, I think, for us to recognize that God never does anything uh, in a way that he hides from his people what he wants 
and desires from them, nor does he hide from them what he's going to do in their behalf. And so as we think about that today, uh, we need to recognize that all of us today are still caught in the grip of the law of sin and uh, that we are in a situation where unless we come to that point of redemption, which is brought to us through the work of repentance and baptism for the remission of sin, you and I need to be thankful that God revealed uh, hundreds of years before Jesus ever showed up on the scene that he was going to bring deliverance and liberty that the house of Israel had not known in all the ages of time. And so, here we go. Uh, all we like sheep have gone astray. First of all, I want to speak to the thought that God refers to us as sheep. Now, sheep are generally very passive, and they generally run in sort of a, a flock kind of a situation, or a herd uh, kind of situation. Uh, sometimes there will be thousands, sometimes hundreds, and sometimes just four or five, but they do have a tendency uh, to uh, sort of uh, uh, get together in uh, association with each other. And that's sort of like we, the Israelites of God, are. And I think that as we look at this, we, we also have to remember that there's something within us we always want to see what's over the next hill, around the next curve, uh, that uh, area that we've not been able to explore or examine yet is always a matter of curiosity, and so it is with sheep. Uh, they can be all together, and uh, uh, at the same time you'll find that one sees something over here or is preoccupied in getting the next clump of grass that uh, looks so enticing, and uh, they will without hesitation just wander off just take off uh, from uh, the crowd, and all at once they're gone. And we know the story of that when Jesus gave us the parable of the lost sheep, where the shepherd left the ninety and nine and went after the one that was lost. And so it is that that's the nature of God's people. And we are bound in sin because of the heritage that we have from our father Adam, and we're still in bondage unless we've been redeemed by the Lord Jesus Christ through the shedding of his blood on the cross of Calvary. Now it's important, I think, for us to recognize that that uh, instinctive nature of ours, wanting to find out what's around the corner over the next hill, uh, in that dark place that we haven't been able to explore, or maybe in the heights that we've not been able to reach yet, uh, there's that curiosity about many things in life, and so it's not unusual for us, like the sheep, uh, to depart from the safety of the group, and we find ourselves drifted away, and here we are out here in no man's land, and we're lost. That each one of us have turned into our own way. We want to do our own thing, make our own decisions. There's something within us that does not really receive... Um, uh, directives too well and sometimes we are very rebellious and and sometimes we are uh, a little bit stupid because uh, instead of sheep running in the face of danger generally they just freeze and, and they just stand there and don't know what to do and isn't that a lot like us today I think it is and I think that as we uh, discuss this we're going to discover that as a result of that uh, the Lord refers to us as sheep. Uh, God refers to us as a, a sheep under the headship of the shepherd, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, it's not strange that Isaiah would uh, start out with this verse, the sixth verse here, in describing the remainder of the prophecy, uh, that we like sheep have gone astray, and we have all turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now you remember last week I told you that whatever God has spoken is established. It's a done deal. It's absolute. It will not change, cannot change, because it is the truth of the word of God. And being truth, it is unalterable. You can't alter it. You can't change it. You can't twist it. 
and make it still be the truth. And so when we have the full truth, we find we're guilty of sin. We live in a carnal, sinful body that thrives on the natural, ungodly activities of this world and uh, is sort of foreign to uh, the ways of God until the Holy Spirit begins to deal with us as a result of someone giving us the Word of God. Remember there's a scripture in the Bible that says um, uh, that if we don't hear we can't, uh, uh, we can't understand and uh, I'm paraphrasing that but uh, certainly it's true. And so uh, we have to recognize that it's the Word of God, which is the truth that, that brings us into that point of, of understanding and recognizing that indeed the Heavenly Father has a particular interest in me because He has chosen me to be one of His vessels in His eternal kingdom. And the same is true of each of you who have come to that point of redemption through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ and the shedding of his blood at the cross. Now, going on from that, uh, Isaiah says, uh, and he begins now to describe the suffering that Jesus was going to go through. But you see, Isaiah is speaking in the past tense because, again, Isaiah understood that what God had spoken already is though it may not actually have taken place in the reality of the event, the event is established and unchangeable when God declares it. And so what does he say? He says, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. Oh, thank God for what Jesus went through that you and I might enjoy and have complete peace and confidence and that eternity is something to be desired, not something to be feared if we have come to that point of redemption through the work of our precious Lord. And so, as you listen today, you say, well, what, what is that work? Well, those of you who have already been redeemed know very well what it is. But in case there are those of you that are listening today that don't know really what I'm talking about, it says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. God tells us that He sent His only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to, to take the place of Adam, whom He created pure, clean, perfect, without sin. But Adam got curious and decided that he would satisfy his wife rather than to uh, keep the oracles of God. And so he sinned, and as a result, since sin and uh, blood is the life of the body and the life of uh, uh, every one of us, and, uh, it was contaminated with sin. Adam could not pass on blood that was pure and clean because his was not. And so uh, after uh, some 4,000 years, uh, we find that Jesus came upon the scene and he was uh, uh, given unto us through uh, the uh, work of the Holy Spirit uh, in that he had uh, the bloodline of Adam before he sinned or at least the same uh, type of blood uh, and, and characteristics that Adam had before he sinned because he was without sin. God created a new blood. I, guess I should say, as um, Mary conceived and then brought forth the Christ child, who later ministered for three and a half years or thereabouts, um, and uh, eventually then went to the cross at a very young age, that you and I might have life and have it more abundantly. And so Isaiah looked ahead, and through the revelation of the Holy Spirit, he saw the oppression of Jesus. You see, from the time Jesus was born, he was under attack. You'll remember that Herod uh, decided that uh, he didn't want the competition, and he was determined that he was going to kill this newborn king uh, that uh, had come upon the scene, and he slaughtered every male child in the in the face of uh, in the house of uh, uh, <coughs> 
He decided he didn't like the competition of this newborn, uh, eventually taking over the throne. And, and so what did he do? He killed every newborn up to the age of two years in all the land. And as a result of that, uh, Mary and Joseph had to flee. They had to leave the area, and Jesus' life was preserved. Uh, as Jesus grew and developed, uh, uh, that now uh, Mary and Joseph take him to the temple, and at the age of 12 years, and there he begins to uh, give forth uh, the word of God and, and uh, recite things that all of the learned men of Israel had not yet come to know or understand, and they stood, uh, as it were, uh, uh, affixed upon him uh, in wonderment because uh, this child had such knowledge and such ability to express it. And so then from there we don't find too much about the Lord until he shows up and is baptized by John the Baptist and begins his ministry. And so now Isaiah sees him in that uh, time from the time he was born to the time that he dies. And he says he was oppressed. What does oppressed mean? It means burdened down with a heavy load. It means that he was pressured and pushed and and there was no opportunity for rest. That he was a, a heavy laden with care and concern. And it's hard for us to figure that to be true uh, even in a child, but we have to remember uh, that he was born the only begotten Son of God and the Word of God was encased within him as he grew and learned and spoke about the normal things of life in the flesh. And so our Lord was uh, oppressed, he was afflicted, and uh, Isaiah says, Yet he opened not his mouth, and he was brought as a lamb to the slaughter. Well, now, when you stop and think about that, without Jesus Christ, that's exactly what happens to all of us who have not been born again into the kingdom of God. Satan is the slaughtermaster, and he's determined to destroy every living soul that God created unto himself. And so, you and I just need to rejoice that God made a way and showed it to Isaiah hundreds of years before it took place. And then we go on in that verse and it says, He's brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And isn't it true? What can we do or say as an individual that can come against the forces of darkness? We're helpless without the strength and the power of the Word of God and the Holy Spirit and and the ability to use the power and the authority of Jesus' name to come against him and to be protected by Almighty God because we've chosen him to be our Heavenly Father and the Lord of all of our life. And so Isaiah saw all of that. And so, again, he went through it all for us so that we might have an avenue of escape from the sin that we were born into and now we can live in the righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, Isaiah points out that Jesus was uh, quiet, did not make a sound in going through all of these things. He never complained. Uh, he accepted what he had to uh, do. Uh, he did not uh, alter that in any way and uh, kept the command of God to live the life that you and I were caught in before he became the intercessor, the deliverer, and above all, the redeemer of the house of Israel. And so it says he opens not his mouth. He did not complain. And then it says he was taken from prison and from judgment. Who shall declare his generation? Now we've touched on this a little bit in the past, but I want to uh, just mention to you something that I think is pretty important. And that is, you know, in the, in the early years, we find that the most important thing is for uh, a man to have a family and reproduce and, and uh, have children. And all through the Old Testament, we find that that was a predominant concern. 
and uh, a woman that could not have a child was uh, uh, considered to be useless because the most important thing uh, to the husband was uh, uh, the fact that uh, he could have children and uh, his name and his family would grow and go on and continue. And that was the accepted thing uh, in the Old Testament and indeed up until about uh, uh, the uh, uh, late 19th century or early 20th century uh, did this attitude change. And the uh, change of that attitude, it's another subject, but I'll just throw it out there. The change of that attitude is uh, uh, what brought on all the abortions and the slaughter of unborn babies uh, that we have today throughout the land and uh, I guess around the world as well. And so anyway, we find that Jesus was cut off. He never had the privilege of, of having a family and having children. Now, yes, we know he did have some brothers and sisters, but he did not have a family of his own. However, when we look at this, uh, we find that he was cut off of the land. Uh, he had no, no privilege, no right. The Bible tells us he didn't even have a place to lay his head. And uh, uh, he was a wanderer, as it were, went from place to place as he preached the word of God and gave us the word of God. And um, it says uh, uh, that uh, for the transgressions of his people, he was stricken. See, he did all of this not because of anything that he earned or deserved as, as chastisement or judgment or retribution. He did this for you and for me to set us free from that bondage that we could not extricate ourselves from. And so verse 9 says, And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. And so we find that he was rejected by everyone. He was rejected by all but a very few followers. You'll remember that even at the, at the time of his um, uh, capture, and in preparation for the trial uh, that was a mock trial and the judgment uh, that was to be brought forth from that, he was ordained to go to the cross and to die there. And uh, the public didn't know. They didn't have a clue what was going on. There was a few uh, godly men that had stuck with the Word of God throughout the years, looked forward to the Messiah. They were able to acknowledge and understand that this man, Jesus, was indeed the Messiah, and yet uh, when it came time for him to uh, pay the ultimate price for you and for me, he stood alone. And those who had been closest to him had lost hope and had literally deserted him. And of course we know about Peter's denial of Christ and all of that that went on as well. And so when we think about all of this, we find Isaiah saw it all. Now let me tell you something. Not only did Isaiah see all of it there in his age that was to come, but you need to know that God has revealed unto us through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the prophetic writings of the Bible what's going to take place when these days on this earth come to an end. And when the judgment of God finally falls upon this world that's so saturated with uh, ungodly deeds and, and uh, terrible, terrible, terrible activities uh, that uh, are really worse than the animal kingdom in many ways. And so we go then to verse 10 and we get to hear something that is hard for us to understand perhaps and yet as we listen to it, it makes sense. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Wow. Now he could not have any children in a family of his own. But when he goes through this crucifixion on the cross of Calvary and rises from the dead, which we'll talk about probably next week, we find that all at once he has a huge family because everyone 
that has come into the kingdom of God through the redemptive work of Jesus uh, now are considered his family. He's the husband, as it were, the Lord, the king, and we are his bride. And what a glorious and beautiful thing that is. And it says, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Now, I've, uh, I just want to take a little side thought here and share something with you. I've tried to explain a number of times to many people that uh, there are really four entities in heaven now in the throne room of God. And we, I, I get this terrible rejection and, Pastor, you've lost it. You're, you're crazy. There's only three. No, there's four. You see... The Word is the Lord. And Jesus was a man. The Lord had pleasure. It pleased Him to bruise the man Jesus. Now, yes, Jesus was filled with the Word of God. But Jesus also had a fleshly body that was very destructible. He was not indestructible as a man. And so here it again proves it. It pleased the Lord, the Word of God, to bruise him, Jesus, the Christ. He hath put him in grief. In other words, it pleased the Lord, the Word of God, to offer the only begotten Son of God, the, the, God, the Son of God in the flesh, Filled with the Word of God, yes, but still uh, he was limited and encased in many ways in the flesh. And the reason for that was that he had to bear and pay the price for you and for me that we might not have to spend eternity outside of the kingdom of God in outer darkness, judgment, whatever awaits out there. Many people have many different ideas and probably put them all together. They're still not sufficient to describe what it would be like not to be in the house of God and in the kingdom of God. And so uh, the Lord took pleasure in what Jesus the man was doing. I've had people say, well, you know, God died on the cross of Calvary. No, he didn't. God didn't die on the cross. God can't die. Well, the Lord died on the cross of Calvary. Well, the Word did not die. The Word cannot die. Well, what died on the cross of Calvary? The man, Jesus Christ. We find then, He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. This is the 11th verse now in chapter 53 of Isaiah. Verse 11, He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied by his knowledge. Shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. You see, Jesus as God, as the Word, could not bear the iniquities of we carnal people who populate this earth. And it was necessary that because Adam sinned, that Jesus give us a second Adam, and yes, the Bible declares that, and the second Adam would not sin in order to pay the price and eradicate the sin that you and I inherited from birth. Now, as we go on, you say, well, what do you mean inherited from birth? Well, you know, there are a lot of people who say, um, well, you know, I've never done anything wrong. Of course, that's a lie to begin with because just as the scripture we read a while ago, all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, how is it that, that uh, uh, I didn't commit sin? How am I a sinner? Well, you're a sinner because you inherited it. You have the fruit of sin when you commit sin. That's the fruit of sin that resides in your natural spirit. And so it is that Jesus had to take the weight of our travail and of our transgressions and of our iniquities, and he had to bear them for us. When 
Adam sinned, it was uh, purity of Adam yielding to the corruption of sin. When Jesus came on the scene and became the sacrificial lamb of God for you and for me, it was the fact that uh, uh, purity now took on sin and destroyed it because truth and purity and holiness uh, always eradicates the corruption of sin. And so when we buy into that, when we yield to that, when we say, okay, Lord, I understand what you did for me, and we accept the fact that he uh, died to redeem us, that means to buy us back into the kingdom of God, that we are indeed a blessed people. We are really, really blessed. And so going into verse 12, it says, Therefore, now this is still the Lord speaking, remember the word of God, God the Father speaking, which is the word coming forth from the Spirit of the Father. Now we find that he is saying, Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great. He shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Now, that means that he took our sin. He took our punishment. He took our judgment. He took a, a, the fruit that we literally should have come forth. And by the way, in this world, we do reap what we sow. But in the eternal kingdom of God, it's going to be erased. And uh, uh, we find that uh, much of it is erased uh, when we uh, come unto the Lord and uh, are born again into his kingdom uh, by the work of redemption. But uh, we, we want to make the point that Jesus literally took the sins of all of God's people upon him. He took the suffering of all of God's people upon him. He took all of the burden and the heartache and the iniquities and the transgressions of all of God's people upon him that we might be set free if we choose to be. You say, well, isn't it just automatic? Oh, no. No, no. There has to be a new birth that comes, and the Bible speaks to that in many places in the Word. Being born again is a common phrase that everybody recognizes. It means that somebody has been changed from the way of sin and ungodliness and has chosen to walk in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, I know we're not always all successful, but by the same token, the blood of Christ, uh, when we come back in our guilt, if we've stained our robes, if we brought ourselves into a place of wherein we had not ought to be, then we find ourselves in a situation where God, again, the Lord, allows the blood of Jesus to cleanse us afresh and to renew us. Uh, the word renew is sort of a a uh, weak word, actually, uh, God is in the business of restoring his people under the purity of Adam before Adam sinned. And that is the people that is going to rule and reign with the Lord Jesus Christ. And see, the bride of Christ, uh, we often refer to that as the church. Today, the church can cover a lot of area that does not include the bride. But the bride of Christ, those that walk in the righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ, are going to rule and reign with him here on this earth. Now, again, I want to stress this. Uh, Christian doctrine today in uh, most uh, uh, of the theological seminaries and most of the churches today uh, have been diverted from the truth here because they stop at this point. Well, you know, when things get tough, uh, uh, Jesus uh, is going to come, but before he does, he's going to lift us all out and we're going to all go to heaven. Well, I wish I could find that really solidly written in the scripture like it's taught, because like it's taught is not true. Jesus is coming back to earth to rule and to reign. Well, yes, Pastor, but that's only for a thousand years. Well, I don't have an opportunity to talk about that just now, but I want to say this to you. 
Uh, if you read the Word of God at the end of the thousand years, this old sinful earth uh, is uh, uh, destroyed. It passes away. The heavens are rolled up. They're contaminated with the sin of Satan and his demonic forces. Uh, and uh, they're going to be rolled up. And what does the Bible say? There's going to be a new Jerusalem descend. That's the headquarters of God. And there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, which God is preparing. The Bible tells us as Jesus left this earth he said it's important that I go away because if I go away I'll prepare a place for you that where I am there you may be now where's that place that he's going to prepare for us it's not up in heaven floating around on a cloud plucking a harp no it is a genuine earth a genuine heaven and the King Jesus is going to rule over all the nations of the world for the thousand years, and then for eternity, he's going to rule with his children, his bride, his brothers and sisters, who are co-heirs with him in the Father. And it's a beautiful, beautiful story. And only our imagination can begin to stretch out into what may be out there, but oh my, the Bible gives us so much information that is not being taught today. And I want you to know we need to begin to listen to it. We need to begin to dig in and search it. And uh, if you disagree with anything that I say, I ask you to do one thing for me before you just uh, ridicule me and want to nail me to the cross, uh, uh, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, why don't you just open the Bible and begin to read it and follow through and and uh, uh, get you uh, uh, some good uh, uh, concordance where you can uh, go from one subject to, to find all the scriptures in the Bible that talks about that subject. Begin to study it out for yourself. If you can prove me wrong, you better know that Pastor Applegate will be the first one to say publicly to you, hey folks, I missed it. And I apologize and this is the way it really is. But until then, I challenge you to look it up, find it for yourself, and you'll be amazed at what you discover. Now going on, verse 12. And with this I'm going to have to close. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great. He shall divide the spoil with the strong. Remember I talked about that. Why? Because he hath poured out his soul unto death, he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many. Now, with that thought, remember that he went to the cross. He died there. When he died there, he took all the sin of the world upon himself and paid the price for that if those who are caught in sin, which is everyone, all of us have gone astray. Everyone has sinned, remember? And so those who will look unto him as the redeeming Lamb of God that was slain for their sin and transgression, they will be in the kingdom of God with the Lord Jesus Christ throughout the ages to come. And who knows, the carnal mind cannot envision what it's going to be like when Jesus rolls away this old world into oblivion and causes the uh, sun to shine from the new heaven, only it won't be the sun, it'll be the holy city of the living God. Well, it's time for us to go to communion, and with those thoughts, I trust that you will begin to understand how important communion really is because it says to the Lord, Lord, I understand what Jesus, the only begotten Son of God, went through. And I thank Him for paying the price for me. So with that, I'm going to turn to the scriptures after this song and we will have communion together. Praise His name.
its great mysteries Surely someday we'll come to an end But faith will conquer the darkness and death and will lead me at last to To change lives today For He changed me completely A new life is mine That is why by the cross to take this time now as we begin to read the scripture that was given unto us by the Lord himself recorded in the book of Luke chapter 22 and it says and when the hour was come he sat down and the twelve apostles with him now I reminded you before that Jesus had sent the disciples ahead to prepare a place that they could have the Passover uh, supper, dinner, whatever you want to call it, together. And so they've done that, and now they're there and they're eating. And uh, Jesus makes this statement now in uh, uh, verse number 15. And he said unto them, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And so he continued on and it says, And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them, saying, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. But we find the juice of the vine, as recorded in uh, verse number 20, actually represents more than had already been represented. It represents the fact that uh, the blood was shed for our transgressions and that the juice of the vine is a sealant, a confirmation, a declaration of agreement for all those who agree with the Lord in communion. It was a new testament, a new commitment, a new covenant, a new beginning. Think of that. For all who would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as the only begotten Son of the living God, the Lamb of God that was slain for your sins and mine. And so with those thoughts 
And let's have a quick word of prayer. You know you're not supposed to take communion if you're living in sin. I'm going to pray very quickly. And we're going to ask God to cleanse those who uh, need to be cleansed. But my prayers won't do it for you. You have to pray yourself. So as I'm praying, you offer your own prayer, will you? Praise the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all you've done. We thank you, Lord, for bearing the guilt and the sin and the wages of death and the powers of destruction. Uh, that sin brings upon those uh, uh, chosen of the Lord. And even now I pray, Father, that you will cleanse any of us who may have stained the garments of righteousness. If there be those out there that are listening that have not yet entered in, I pray that the Holy Spirit will draw them to that place uh, of repentance and, and redemption through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as we take of these sacraments, Lord, we give you praise and thanksgiving for all you did. And Father, we pray this and claim this, actually declaring it unto you, O God, because of your heavenly decision to give unto us the Lamb that was slain for our sin. And so, Lord, we pray this in your name. And we give God the praise and the glory for allowing you, preparing you to stand before his throne in our behalf. And so we declare it in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now let us take of the bread. Thank you, Lord. The bread represents the broken body of the Lord Jesus Christ, the flesh that was torn from the bones of the Lord. And so let us eat together. And again, I've already talked about what the juice of the vine represents, the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. As we drink of it, it's a, a sealant between the Heavenly Father and you and me, that through Jesus' sacrifice for us, the giving of his life, that you and I have eternal life, having been redeemed into the kingdom of God, and our feet firmly set and established in your word. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us drink together. And so now as we conclude uh, this Sunday study, we want to invite you to come back and be with us for another study next Sunday. We put a new one up on the internet every week. It generally goes up on Saturday, uh, but it's always there by Sunday morning. That's our beginning time, and it will stay there until the following Sunday. There are over 380 studies that we've made down through the years that are on our archive pages. And you can go to any one of those and you can either just uh, download them and listen to them. Or you can download them and save them and make them a matter of study and, and help. In most of the modern instruments today, uh, you'll find they'll receive... Uh, those studies that are in our archives. So, a lot of material there for you to look at and study and to question, and maybe it'll be surprising to you what you might learn. God is faithful to anoint His Word and to quicken those in spirit who are hungry to walk in His righteousness. With that, I have to say goodbye for now. We'll be back again next week. Praise the name of the Lord. Jesus the Christ. You have been listening to Christian Living 101 with Pastor Gene Applegate. This study is presented without church or organizational bias. We are totally supported by your prayers and generosity. Your comments and questions are welcome. Email us at gene at christianliving101.org or write to Christian Living 101, P.O. Box 72150, Phoenix, Arizona, 85050. 
That's gene at christianliving101.org or write us at Christian Living 101, P.O. Box 72150, Phoenix, Arizona, 85050.